Good morning. Good to see you folks here. I remember my first time with the church was at a different location. And uh, I still remember a couple faces from that time, but not, not so many. But it's exciting to see all you folks that are here today and our opportunity to worship the Lord together. I want you to go to Revelation chapter 22 with me. going to read verse 17. Man, I've got good news. It may not seem like news to you. You may have grown up hearing it your entire life. Or you may have heard it recently. Or it might be the first time you would hear it. But man, have I got good news. Look at verse 17. Revelation chapter 22. Last message of the Bible. And the Spirit... And the bride say, come. Let him that heareth say, come. Let him that is a thirst, come. So what in the world are we talking about? And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. And this is the good news. The water of life is available to whosoever will, and it's free. You can't get better news than that. Now, a little bit of background, what we're going to look at today. I am um, uh, going to address a teaching that is, is booming in Baptist circles and Bible church circles called Calvinism. It is the belief that God has chosen some people to salvation and chosen some people to hell. The only issue is God's choice. It is a teaching that growing and growing in influence. It's not new. The very name Calvinism goes back 500 years. A man named John Calvin uh, in the 1500s uh, began to teach this. He didn't invent this doctrine, but he sort of popularized it and left his name on it. And it was during a period of time when so many churches were leaving Catholicism. It was the state church in country after country in Europe. And they were leaving Catholicism, and there was a preaching of the gospel, and um, they uh, were sort of starting from scratch. They didn't have Bible colleges. They didn't have seminaries. They didn't have universities. They didn't have publishing houses. They didn't have books. Everything had been under the domain of Rome. So now they're coming out, and everything is new and fresh, and uh, there's some sense of the truth on the part of folks, but uh, also some wandering in the wilderness on the part of folks. And uh, a fellow named John Calvin was approached. They said, we need a doctrines book a book that covers the basic doctrines of the Bible. John Calvin was 26. He had two college degrees. He had been trained as a Catholic priest, and he had been trained as a lawyer. He had not had much time to exercise either of those things. He professed faith in Christ. He came out of Catholicism, and now he's a part of this Reformation movement, obviously a very brilliant young man, and he's approached about producing this doctrinal book. He produces in, in the modern printing what is a 1,300-page doctrine book that covers doctrine from beginning to the end all the way through, and it is very significant. It's been in print this entire 500-year period of time. That's an incredible thing for a book. It has sold more copies than any other doctrines book written by any person. So its influence has been great. And parts of it are very good. Parts of it you can tell were written by a lawyer. Parts of it you can tell were written by somebody whose only training was as a Catholic priest. And uh, he probably did the very best he could with a set of circumstances. He hadn't had one day of sound Bible training in his entire life. So there he is. He's producing this book. And it teaches, when you get to the subject of salvation, the idea that God's predestined some people to heaven and has predestined some people to hell. And that's simply the issue. Did God predestine you this way, or did God predestine you that way? It is a doctrine that, at least in, in fundamental Baptist circles and Bible church circles, will rise up for a while and be very popular, and then it fades away because it kills the churches that believe it. It kills the Bible colleges, and it kills the mission boards that believe it. It'll fade away. And then it'll come back after a few years. 
in my lifetime, I have been preaching now for 51 years. Started when I was three, I want you to understand that. But, it was a, but, but I have been preaching for 51 years. That part of the story is true anyway. And uh, it, was, it was a big deal when I started preaching. It faded away. You didn't hear much about it in our circles for 20 years. And it came back. And then it faded away. Now it has come back. It has come back with a roar and a boom. Two things happened that's made this very significant. One is the internet. There are more preachers than you can count teaching this and exercising this influence on, influence on the internet and YouTube channels and that kind of thing. And uh, used to be uh, that if a preacher wanted to protect his church from this false teaching, he simply never scheduled a Calvinist to preach in his church. And that was it. Boy, that's not the issue anymore. Everybody has thousands of Calvinist preachers at their fingertip now. And then secondly, during the pandemic, a lot of us were just frustrated by what was going on and the limitations and church coming together. Some of the Calvinists, it was good marketing, they took great advantage of the pandemic, encouraging their followers to get a hold of people on the internet and try to introduce their message to those people using that vehicle. And I mean, it spread and spread and spread and boomed and exploded all over the world. I'm very sensitive to this because I grew up in a half Calvinist family. And here's what I say when I call it a half Calvinist. My father was an announced atheist. By the grace of God, he got saved a few months before he died, which I rejoice. But <clears throat> he had spent a lot of time as an atheist. My mom, her brothers and sisters, were all very strong Calvinists, very committed to the idea, God saves who he wants to save. That's the issue. They were so committed to it, they said that to give somebody a gospel track insulted a sovereign God because you didn't know if that person was predestined to be saved or not. They believed that missionaries were an insult to a sovereign God. They believed any kind of invitation to salvation was insulting a sovereign God. And, and they were just very, very strong Calvinists. I grew up with those two influences. Okay. I've always been an enormously curious person. and like to go see and hear things for myself. And at age 10... Somebody came by knocking on our door. They were building a bus route to pick up kids for church in our neighborhood. They knocked on our door. Mom and dad were not home. I answered the door. We talked for a bit. They invited me to church, and I said, sure, because I was curious. I saw church buildings everywhere. I'd never been in one. I didn't know what they were. I didn't know what they did. I wanted to see what a church was, so I said yes. Mom and dad were not happy, but they did not forbid my going. And I went to that church, and at church, at that church, I heard the gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ, that Christ had died on the cross of Calvary for all men. And I received that message, and I trusted what Jesus Christ did for me. That would later be a factor in my dad getting saved and all. But I grew up with all that. Family didn't care much whether I went to church or not or where I went. Like I said, I've always been a curious sort. I remember one time I was in Indianapolis and a black pastor in Indianapolis and the black Muslims announced they were having a seminar. The seminar was about how all white people are indwelt by the devil. And I thought that sounded like an interesting topic. <laughs> so I went. Learned a lot of interesting things. Uh, as you can guess, I, I was kind of isolated there in the crowd. And uh, I, I was kind of the only person that worked on my tan during the summer. Let's put it that way. And, uh, but, I, but I learned a whole lot. They said that Satan had created all white people. And that might come as a surprise to some of you. It said Satan created white people and put it in the, on another planet and brought them to the earth, put it in their DNA to persecute black people. And that's how all white people were. It said most white people don't even know they're like that. But that's the way Satan created them. So. That's what it all talked about. I said, I, I've been to all kinds of things. But I went to church when I was 10, a church where the gospel was preached. And I trusted Christ as my Savior. At age 17, I met a teen camp program for teenagers. 
And I hear a message challenging people to full-time Christian service. It's on my mind all the next day, everywhere I went. We're playing softball. I'm having trouble concentrating on the game. We're hiking. I'm having trouble thinking about where we're at. That, that message rang in my heart about people being set aside for full-time Christian work. And that next night, I surrendered my heart and my life uh, to be used of the Lord any way he wanted to use me. That was right before my senior year in high school. So that meant going to Bible college, preparing, studying. So I spent my senior year trying to figure out what Bible college I would go to. Now, my mom, my aunts, and my uncles were not happy. And, and they spent my senior year of high school trying to persuade me not to go that direction. They said, you'd be in, because they knew I wasn't going to be that, I wasn't going to be a Calvinist preacher. I was going to be a preacher that offered the gospel to everybody. They said, you're insulting God. You're caught up in false theology. They said, there's no money in it. And, and I said, you want to be a doctor or a lawyer or something where you can make the big money. And they said, you're wasting your life. They said, you'll look back on this experience and say, I wasted my life. Well, I'll be honest with you. I'm 71. I graduated from Bible college when I was 21. I've been preaching, started preaching while I was in Bible college. I've been in full-time ministry for 50 years, been preaching for 51 years, and I haven't got to that day yet when I look back on it and feel like it was wasted. But I, because of all their talk about Calvinism, I was very sensitive to the subject. So while I was a college student, I read all 1,300 pages of John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion to try and understand what the issues were and what the big deal was. I frankly think I deserve some kind of an award for reading the whole thing. It was not easy reading. Much of the time it was not pleasant reading. But I've been conscious of this issue ever since. And, and I've been very clear on what I believe is the offer of the gospel to whosoever will. And the free offer of the gospel, let him take the water of life freely. Several years ago, before the pandemic, I was asked to teach for a week at a Bible college in North Carolina. And they said, we'd like you to teach a class on the dangers of Calvinism. Not just mention it in a class. Why don't you teach a whole college course on the dangers of Calvinism? I'd never heard of that before, but I worked on it. I, I put together 20 hours of lectures, and I went to the college in North Carolina and taught it. I go every year in August and January. I'll be leaving Wednesday for this year's trip. I go to the Philippines. And while I'm in the Philippines, I preach in several churches, but I also teach in several Bible colleges there. And there's a Bible college I teach at every year. And so we, we'd missed two years because of the pandemic. And I was about to go, and they got hold of me last minute and said, Brother Stringer, can we change the topic for your class? We heard you say that you had taught a college class on the dangers of Calvinism. That's become a huge issue here in the Philippines. Could you teach that here at our college? That's well, not a problem. I've taught it before. I, I got, you know, 20 hours of notes. I got all the material. And so, yeah, I'll bring that. We'll teach that instead. I get to the Philippines. It'll be, be first week of August. It'll be two years ago. I get to the Philippines. I'm out preaching in churches a week before the college class will start. We have 40 students in the college there. And so I'm expecting to teach, you know, 40 young people. And, and I'm preaching in Bataan, a college in Manila. I'm preaching in Bataan, and an American missionary comes over to me. He says, Brother Stringer, we've heard you're going to teach a class on the dangers of Calvinism. I say, yes. He said, we have a college here. We really need that class. Would you come teach that class for us? I said, well, I'd love to, brother, but you have to understand every day of my trip, is booked and scheduled long before I get here. I don't have any flexibility. He said, could we bring our young people to Manila to be in that class? So I'll talk to the college. I don't know why not. They said, fine. Word got out. And, and within a week, we not only had one college or two colleges, seven colleges had come together. We had 275 young people. I'm telling you, 275 college-age young people in the same room is an exciting moment regardless. 
they don't know each other. They're me. I'm, and, and the auditorium we were in would hold 260. So we were packed. And they're excited. So I come in for the first day. And you have to understand, I'm from a different generation. My, uh, my thought, cell phone, the purpose of a cell phone is to call somebody. I didn't realize it involves everything in life. So I come in a first day of class, packed with students. It's exciting. And they've all got cell phones out. And I'm thinking, they don't need to be calling anybody during class. That's not what they were doing. They were all recording the class. And they were posting it on every form of social media you've ever heard of. Within 24 hours, it went around the world. I mean, but that, that night, I'm hearing from Bermuda, I'm hearing from Sri Lanka, I'm hearing from Greece, I'm hearing from Indonesia. And, and it started what I have called the class that would not die because there has not been a day in my life I have not heard from that class. I was just saying this last Sunday morning, talking about this to the preacher I preach for in Plantation, Florida. I was just telling him about the class that wouldn't die, and this just goes on and on. And um, <clears throat> we were in his office. We go out to get morning service, and a family comes up and introduces themselves. They've never been in the church before. But they've heard that I was going to be there to preach, and they've listened to the class on the Internet. And so they were coming to the church for the first time. And uh, it went all over the place. It was, it was amazing. And uh, I have invitations to speak on the subject all over the world. I have now spoken at three other colleges in the Philippines, two in the United States, one in Australia, and one in New Zealand I've taught the class. And uh, so it's going to be very, very interesting. Tons of response. I literally hear every day of the life, my, my life uh, from this class. Probably 90% of what I hear is positive and encouraged and a blessing. There is another 10% of folks who aren't happy and who are critical and feel the need to let me know. And it's just part, goes with the territory. If you're going to do anything, these things happen. It doesn't bother me, but it's interesting. And so I've had a lot. Uh, and I haven't had anything yet today, but I had criticism for the class on uh, Facebook yesterday. And today's not over yet. Okay. And uh, so it just goes on and on and on. And uh, I, I, I sat down and listened. What are the reasons people criticize this message? And, and so I listed a bunch of them. The, the main re most common reasons people would criticize me for announcing the good news that I announced at the beginning of this class. There is a gift of everlasting life. It is offered freely to whosoever who will believe. And so I just sort of listed, we won't get to all of them this morning, but I just thought we'd look at a few of them together this morning and, and see what the scripture says. First of all, the number one reason people say, well, you're telling people, talking to people like they can get saved. No one can get saved unless the Holy Spirit calls them. Okay, that's true. You want to know who the Holy Spirit calls? The verse we started with? And the Spirit and the bride say, come. The subject clearly is eternal life. And what's the message of the Spirit? It's come. That is the message of the Holy Spirit. That he wants you to come and receive this gift. And notice it says, the Spirit and the bride. If I understand the bride of Christ correctly, it is a reference to the fact that one day in the future, all New Testament believers will be together in a ceremony referred to as the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. Okay. Uh, today, we exist as individual churches, assemblies, many which serve the Lord and honor the Lord. One day, we'll all be together in heaven and we'll be the general assembly of the church of the firstborn. It'll still be a local church. We'll all be there, but it's going to be some church. It's going to be all of us. And heaven is referred to as the bride of Christ. 
You know what the message of the bride's supposed to be? Come. That's why the Great Commission's been given to the church to take the gospel to all nations and teach all people. The message of the Spirit is, it's come. You want the message of the bride is, it's come. I, I was thrown for a little bit about the next sentence. Let him that heareth say, come. Why is the person hearing the message saying, come? And I had to think about that for a while. My, at the time, five-year-old grandson helped me figure this out. His name's Riley. He has an older brother named Andrew, and he can't stand it any time Andrew gets to do something and he doesn't. So I'm talking to Andrew about something we're going to do as a family, and we're going to go do this. And, and Riley hears me, he comes over and goes, Riley, come! <laughs> and I got it. It's being asked in the form of a question. Let the person that hears ask, come? can I come? See, there's a lot of Bible questions I might have trouble answering. Ask that one. I know the answer to that one. Okay? Ask if you can come. I know the answer. The answer is whosoever will. I was preaching at a church in, in uh, Maryland. I'd been there several years ago. I'd preached in the church. Some folks came up to me before the service started. They said, there's a young man in our church. He's come forward on the invitation seven Sundays in a row to talk about salvation, but he doesn't get saved. As one of you know, I never run a church invitation myself. As a pastor, I did, but I always believed the pastor's in charge of how to handle all that. So I preached, and I went and sat down. As soon as I went and sat down, a young man came over and sat next to me, and I guessed correctly it was the young man they were talking about. He said, preacher, he said, I know the people here think I don't want to be saved. But he said, I do, I do. But he said, this doesn't make any sense to me. This is not logical. How can somebody else pay for my sin? He said, surely I have to pay for my own sin. He said, this is not logical. I said, and you know what? I said, I agree with you. It's not man's logic. We never call it logic. We call it grace. I said, the Lord tells us this gift is for us. And I said, I'm not going to sit here this morning and call him a liar. I said, you want to call him a liar? We were sitting on the front row on this side. He stood up, looked down at me and pointed and said, I believe. Trusted Christ. He came back, told the pastor that night that he got saved. I was preaching in the church a year later. I'm on an airplane flying. I said, I wonder if I'll see him. Sometimes me, people make professions of faith you'll never see again. But I said, I wonder about him. I got there. He was in the church. He was baptized. He's serving the Lord faithfully, actively serving the Lord there. And um, that was great. I just preached there again this March after not being there for three or four years. I just preached there. And the pastor was telling that story during an invitation about how this young man got saved. Pastor telling the story. There was a couple sitting there. They'd never been in the church before. It was a black man with a white woman. We're in the South. Some folks would still react to that. And they'd never been there before and didn't know how they are going to be received. And the pastor said, this is for you. And the black gentleman gets up. He walks forward. He takes the pastor's hand. He said, is it for me? Married to a white woman? Pastor said it has to be because it's for everyone. If it's for everyone, it has to be for you. And he got saved. Came back that night, came back Wednesday night, Tuesday night, uh, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, through the whole meeting. That lady was already saved. It's for everybody. Feel free to ask. Okay? You might have some questions I can't answer. But feel free to ask this one. I got the answer to this one. Is it for you? Absolutely. When I pastored in Chicago, the Lord gave us a great ministry with Ethiopians. We got to a place where we're running about 150 Ethiopians in a special service every Sunday. 
And um, during the course of that time, my little five-year-old boy, his name was Boaz. And his mom called me. And she said, Boaz has been talking about salvation. Can he come talk to you, Pat? I said, sure. He comes right in my office. And he sits down in a chair across from my desk. I said, Boaz, I understand you've been asking questions about salvation. And he said, that's right, Pastor. I said, do you know what salvation means? He looked at me and he said, it means Jesus died for my sins. And I forget all the other stuff. <laughs> I said, you got all of it. And when you're talking about salvation, you can forget all the other stuff. Jesus died for your sins. Since then, the Ethiopians have become an independent church in Chicago. I preach for them the Sunday before Christmas every year, uh, starting two year, started two years ago. And so I went out and um, came up and told me, said, we we're bringing the teenagers in. Normally, teenagers have a separate church uh, service, but said, we're bringing the teenagers in today. He said, they have a special church service because their service is in English. And our service is normally in Amharic, but most of our people speak enough English, so we're all going to be together with you this morning. And they said, we thought you might want to meet who preaches to the teenagers. And while the adults were basically Ethiopians, the teenagers were Ethiopian and Anglos and Chinese and Korean and all that. And I went, little Boaz. Little Boaz. <laughs> looking down on me he preaches every sunday morning in the teen church i just looked at him and said boaz what are you preaching he smiled and said that jesus died for their sins that is the message of the gospel feel free to ask you want to know who that's for it's for you and then the second biggest thing they would that people would say uh, folks would fuss and say, well, who's Phil Stringer? Who are you to talk about it? Who are you to correct great theologians like John Calvin? Who are you to correct John Gill? Who are you to correct A.W. Pink? Who are you to correct John MacArthur and R.C. Sproul? Who are you? You're nobody. Let me, let me say in great clarity, that's true. I'm nobody. Can I tell you something else? When it comes to doctrine, so is everybody else. All doctrine should be based on plain, clear statements from the Bible, not the word of any theologian. Well, I will agree cheerfully when it comes to doctrine, Phil Stringer's nobody. When it comes to doctrine, John Calvin's nobody. R.C. Sproul is nobody. John MacArthur is nobody. Plain, clear statement. By, want a plain, clear statement? Let's go to 1 John, not far away. Chapter 2. Verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he's a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also... For the sins of the whole world. Wonder what whole world, who whole world refers to. Aren't you glad no matter who you are, no matter what your background is, no matter what your nationality is, no matter what your ethnicity is, no matter what part of the country or the world you came from, when the Bible says the whole world, it means you. That's why I said I got an announcement of good news. The good news is this great gift of salvation is offered to you. Would you look with me? Most famous verse in the Bible, probably John chapter 3. And, and another reason that folks who would send their criticisms in would bring up often, they say God's sovereign. If God's sovereign, he must pick who gets saved and who doesn't get saved. And so if God's sovereign, you can't have any choice in the matter. And my response to that is, if God's sovereign, I don't get to tell him how he does things. He tells me. I don't get to say, if you're, if you're in charge, this is how you have to do it. That would put me in charge. He tells me how he does it. 
And look what he says. We pick up in John chapter 3 and verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Man, aren't you glad it reads like the world and whosoever? Because I get included in that. This gospel is for the world. And if you wanted to go with me to Second Peter chapter 3. I would say you're, you're taking these scriptures that you use out of context. I heard that in criticisms a lot. Well, you tell me exactly what the context of it is. And one of the things I had said, and I, when I first taught this class, I said to be a Calvinist, you have to believe that the word all doesn't mean all. And I said, you can fool a seminary professor about what the word all means, but you can't fool a bus kid. Now, here's what I mean. And when I was a bus kid, I was a bus kid from age 10 till I bought my first car when I was 16 and started driving myself to church. Bus kids are famous. They're famous for their pranks and wild behavior. And I understand that because I helped create that reputation. <laughs> we weren't bad when you picked us up in the morning because we weren't awake. We'd sort of stumble out to the bus, we get on the bus, we're, we're, we're zombied out. Mom and Dad aren't there to make us behave, but we're, we're not really awake. Not bad on the bus on the way in. They get us to church, and we go into Sunday school, and inevitably, inevitably, to get us to behave, they would bribe us in Sunday school with candy. And we went from Sunday school to junior church, where again they would bribe us with candy to behave. Now we're fully awake on a sugar high and there's a bunch of us on the bus together on the way home. So how do you guess we behaved? Okay. But I'm going to tell you, if you'd said to a group of bus kids in junior church, we're going to give you all candy at the end of junior church. And you got to the end of junior church and you had said, by all, I just mean you, you over there. You want to know what you would have gotten? An explosion. Because every bus kid knew what the word all meant. We had, as I mentioned, we have this class. We have 275 students. They're in an auditorium that's in two parts like this is. 260 is packed. It's two sections. In the Philippines, they have a custom I call second breakfast. They call it merienda. Yeah? And merienda is at 10 o'clock, you stop and you eat. I don't care where you are or what you're doing, it's built into the culture. So I'd have a note on the pulpit in front of me as I'm getting up to teach. This is at 10 o'clock. The Marianda is such and such. And what you want to do is at 10 o'clock, tell the students to go to room seven, get their Marianda. They have 15 minutes to eat it and be back in class at 10.15. So I get up the first day. I said, well, I've got good news. Merienda breaks here. We have a merienda for all of you. And today the merienda is mango bread. And you just right down the hallway, turn left, go to room seven, get it. You need to move quickly because we pick up class again at 1015. I said, we have one for all of you. And I said, by all, I mean the people sitting on this side of the auditorium. Everybody laughed. Nobody took me seriously. You know who went and got their Marianda? All of them. Whether they sit on this side or this side. Next morning, I have a note on the pulpit. Marianda today is, I forget what it was, whatever it was. Marianda today is such and such. I said it's 10 o'clock. It's Marianda break time. You just after the hallway, turn left, and, and you go to room seven. There's a Marianda for everybody. 
and you've got 15 minutes to go get your Miriam and eat it and then get back in because we restart class at 1015. And I said, by all, I mean just the people on this side. And everybody laughed. And nobody took me seriously. You want to know who went, got up and went and got their second breakfast? All of them did. Because you couldn't tell them that all just meant them. Or them. Third day, I did the same thing. Only I said all means you people. But on the fourth day, I said, I have got wonderful news. I just discovered the definition of the word all. It's our Marianda break. The Marianda today is such and such. It's available right down the hallway to the left in room seven. But it turns out that all means all. Isn't that amazing? Aren't I a great scholar to be able to figure that out? Man, I'm a deep theologian if I understand that. That all means all. The truth was, they all understood that without my telling them. And glory to God. Would you look with me? First, uh, our second Peter, chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. And is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish. But that, how many? All, all should come to repentance. I, I, I wonder who all there refers to. See, all theology should be based on plain, clear statements from the Bible. Now, the Calvinist Christ, well, all there doesn't mean everyone. All there means all that the Lord has chosen. It's not what it says. They say world in John 3.16 doesn't mean everyone in the world. It means all different kinds of people in the world. But it's not what it says. Would you go with me? First Timothy. Chapter 2. They'd complain and say, well, Baptists historically have been Calvinists. And you have to be a Calvinist or an Arminian. I said, who says so? There's one thing here over here. Well, you either got to pick between Calvinism and Arminian, Arminism and belief you can lose your salvation. Said, why do you have to pick? Who said? Who's in charge of what I believe? And by the way, I know for a fact I'm not a Calvinist. I grew up with it. I know what it teaches. I've read all of John Calvin's 1,300 pages, and I bought his complete commentary set. I looked things up in it. I know I am not a Calvinist, but I also know I'm not an Arminian. The church I was saved in split when I was 15 over the definition of the gospel. I come to church one morning. I'm told the pastor's been fired for preaching that salvation is by faith alone. I'm stunned. Understand, I'm a bus kid. I'm not a theologian. It's the only church I've ever been to. I just assumed every church taught salvation was by faith alone. As far as I knew, that's what the Catholic Church taught and the Nazarene Church. I just, I just figured everybody taught that. It's the only thing I knew. I'm stunned. And... Um, I'd later call the pastor, uh, pastor they dismiss, say, what should I do? I know what they're saying is not the truth. He said, find an independent Baptist church. True story about how I became an independent Baptist. We had an independent Baptist church. I'm still a bus kid. I'm 15. I can't drive. And, but there was an independent Baptist church bus that made stops on our block. So the next Sunday morning, I went out and waved the bus down said, can I ride to church? Easiest bus rider they ever got. Next Saturday, on their teen visitation, three pretty teenage girls came out to my house and invited me back to church. <laughs> Did I mention I was a 15-year-old boy? <laughs> At that moment, I became a Baptist. <laughs> True story. Uh, uh, Later years, I had better, had better and more reasons, but at that moment, that's how I became Baptist. Uh, 
I know I'm not an Arminian. At age 10, I rejected the idea of Calvinism. And at age 15, I rejected the idea of Arminianism and believed in salvation by faith. So I know for an absolute fact, I didn't just pick this up for a long time. I've not been a Calvinist. I've not been an Arminian. You don't have to pick between the two. That's just something somebody made up. You look First 1 Timothy chapter 2. And you pick up verse 4. How about God our Savior, verse 3. Who will have who to be saved? All men. Oh, what's it mean when God says all men? Say, so, well, this theologian says it means this, and that theologian says it means that. Yeah, but theology is not supposed to be based on theologians. Theology is supposed to be based on plain, clear statements of the Bible. And this is a plain, clear statement of the Bible that is repeated over and over and over again. So you want to know who this message is for? All men. Aren't you glad? I was preaching on this in Fairbanks, Alaska. A young man came forward in the invitation, talked to a personal worker. Personal worker relayed to me later. He came and said, I've grown up in a church that taught salvation was for some but not for all. He said, I've always wondered which one I was. Wouldn't that be a terrible thing to wonder about? Am I the chosen or not the chosen? But he said, that young man said, I've always wondered which one I was. But he said, if this is for everybody, I want in on it. Aren't you glad? It's for everybody. You know what that means? It's for you. Aren't you glad it's for you? Aren't you glad the offer of eternal life is for you? It means it's for your family. It means it's for your friends. It means it's for the whole world. Well, of all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. Wonder who all means. And aren't you glad? It means you. Aren't you glad you're included in all? Aren't you glad when it says whosoever? When I was a kid in junior church, will you sing a little chorus? Whosoever surely meaneth me, surely meaneth me, surely meaneth me, whosoever meaneth me. Man, aren't you glad you have a stake in that promise that whosoever means you I've had people tell me over the years this can't be for me God would never want me I always respond the same way like I did with the young man I was telling you about I was using this illustration in Sunday school that asked to go witness to a man from Puerto Rico in a hospital who was dying when I was in Chicago and I went out and and never met the person who asked me, and I don't know what they were thinking because they didn't tell me he didn't speak English. So I get there. I'm trying my best to communicate salvation to him, and it's not, it's not registering at all. And I look over, and in the doorway, there's a lady in a nurse's uniform, obviously Hispanic. Turns out she's Puerto Rican. She's crying. And she says, Pastor, she says, I, I'm from the Spanish department of the First Baptist Church of Hammond. She said, I wasn't scheduled to work tonight, and I didn't want to work tonight. She, they called me and made me come in. She said, I was mad. She said, now I think I know why I'm here. She said, with your permission, I'd like to translate for you. So I spoke to him about salvation. She translated. And when we had gone through the gospel, he asked the question to me back through her. Why me? Why would God want me? He said, I've lived virtually my entire life without ever doing one thing for him. Why would he want me? It's a significant question. And you want to know what my answer was? This is so profound. My answer was, I don't know. 
It said, don't take it personal. I don't know why he wants me either. But he says he does. So I'm not going to call him a liar. You said you're at the end of your life. Do you want to call him a liar? And she translates back and, and back. He says, no, I don't. Neither should you. This message is for you who will have all men to be saved, come to knowledge of One more. There are many more. I've got 180 of these, but I didn't figure you wanted to stay that long this afternoon. So I got nowhere to go. I'm preaching not far from here tonight. I got the whole afternoon free, but I thought you might not have. So we'll just do one more. Acts chapter 17. And verse 30. Paul's preaching on Mars Hill. The assembled priests and priestesses of a multitude of false religions, Mars Hill was a section of Athens devoted to religion. Any religion could have a statue or an altar there. And priests and priestesses roam the hill, sharing the message of their religion. So I mean, this is an interesting crowd to preach to. He's preaching to a crowd of priests and priestesses from false religions. They had an altar inscribed to the unknown God. That altar has been found uncovered is in the British Museum today. I've been there, I've seen it. I was astonished at how big it is. It's bigger than this whole room. The words are written five foot high. I set out, a, a, and there's a glass thing separating you from it, but I, I sat there looking at it just astonished. And it said, to the unknown God. Because what they were saying was, we have all this religion, but we know we've missed something. To whatever it is we missed, we honor you. <laughs> Lord through Paul says, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth, verse 30, now commandeth who? All men. I wonder who that refers to. You might be able to figure that out. You might say, but I'm not a trained theologian. <laughs> you don't need to be a trained theologian to know what all means. <laughs> you say, well, I'm brand new at church. You don't have to be a veteran to know what all means. You want to know what all men means? It means all men. Commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Glory to God, I have good news. Just like I announced at the start, there is a gift of eternal life. It is given freely because it's paid for already by the Lord Jesus. It's offered to me and it's offered to you. And if you've already trusted Christ as your Savior, you have something to rejoice in in this wonderful. It's for you. Glory to God for your neighbors and your friends. You've got, you might know some people, you think they are there, they're just the farthest from God anybody could possibly be. When I pastored, we had a special Sunday. I said, this Sunday, this is your task this week for next Sunday. I want you to pick the person you know that is least likely to listen to the message of the gospel. And that's who I want you to go visit this week. The hardest case you can think of. Well, a lot of folks went and talked to people and were harshly received. But one of the men that was invited came the next Sunday morning and trusted Christ as his Savior. You want to know who this message is for? It's, mess it's for your friends. It's for your neighbors. It's for your relatives. And it's for the whole world which means your church 
has a reason to support, promote, invest yourself in missions that you could get this message to the entire world. I close with this. Normally when an independent Baptist preacher says he's closing, it means nothing. But since I'm in a Bible church this morning, well, we'll, we'll mean it. I'm in Cambodia. I'm asked if I'd be willing to go out in the jungle. There's a valley on the border between Cambodia and Vietnam. And uh, during the Cambodian Holocaust, the missionaries had to leave and the people had left, but now they were coming back to their historic valley. And in that valley, no electricity. When I preached, literally three men had the job. They had spears and they'd go around the service with their spears looking for poisonous snakes, trying to keep the poisonous snakes from getting in the service. While I'm preaching, one of them got one. I could see him in the back. He speared it. He's holding it up, showing the other two, and the snake is still alive, but it's on the spear, and it's writhing and all that. And I said, man, glory to God, he wasn't in the service. <laughs> I came back to college and wanted to give all three of those men honorary doctorates. I really did. Missionaries in the 1950s had gone into that valley and preach the gospel to those people. And there were today in that valley 34 independent Bible-believing churches preaching the gospel on the border between Vietnam and Cambodia. Because somebody along the way, some church said, man, it'd be a good thing to send some missionaries out to preach the gospel to some people, wouldn't it? I mean, this message is for them people say where's the right place to send missionaries there isn't a wrong one you can't make a mistake because it's for all men everywhere if you never trusted christ as your savior you ought to trust him this very morning put your faith and trust in what jesus christ did for you on the cross of calvary pastor Thank you, Dr. Stringer. Now, I know we've got to get done here soon because Colin's got to go to work. So, uh, don't worry about <laughs> we'll get a couple of minutes. We don't want him to get fired yet. He just started there at Meyer. So, um, thank you, Dr. Springer. Great message. The truth is, that's the reason we started this church here in Lafayette, Indiana, because we want to make the gospel clear that it's for everybody and simple faith in Christ. You can know for sure you have eternal life. You can know it. If somebody asks you, am I going to heaven? Yes, because Christ died on a cross for my sins, all your sins. And it's, that's the most wonderful news in all the world. And it's not of works, lest any man should boast, as this verse tells you up here in Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. So I just thank Dr. Stringer for coming and making that so clear to us this morning. Um, we're going to have our final hymn here in just a second, but let me go ahead and close in prayer. And if you haven't trusted Christ the Savior and you're here this morning, you can trust him right now. You know, just in the quietness of your mind, let God know that, hey, I trust Jesus Christ, what he did in the cross for my sins. If you are saved then go and tell somebody, invite them to church. Next week, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 19, like one of the most exciting chapters in the Bible. It's all about the return of Christ. So let's go ahead and close in prayer, and then we'll have our final hymn. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the message today about whosoever will may come, and all means all. And Lord, we pray that we truly, truly understand that salvation is a free gift, and we accept that message as the truth from God's word. The authority of his word, he says, you can have eternal life just by simple faith in Christ. Pray you'll bless the remainder of the day. Pray that we all have some time afterwards to enjoy one of our muffins. If not, that just bring us back again next week safely. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.